1536. England's queen in exile lies dying in a castle, her sudden collapse surrounded by whispers of poison and plots. Centuries later, the biological traces preserved on Catherine of Aragon's belongings face DNA and toxin testing for the first time. Other strange metals, chronic illness proteins and chemical residues proof of forgotten Tudor medicine, or something sinister? What these new findings reveal could finally challenge everything believed about her death. The real investigation begins with the pressures closing in on Catherine's final days. Subscribe for more revelations from history's hidden corners. Kimbolton Castle, once a symbol of royal privilege, became a place of forced separation for Catherine of Aragon. In the winter of 1534, the official order to reduce her household arrived. Servants who had attended her for decades were dismissed in waves. By the final year, fewer than 40 remained, barely enough to maintain the cold, drafty chambers. Payment records from the period confirm a shrinking payroll, with trusted attendants replaced by strangers loyal to the King's Council. The castle's provisioning lists show a sharp decline in supplies, with less wine, fewer delicacies, and a rationing of firewood. Even the simplest comforts grew scarce. Catherine's daughter Mary was forbidden from visiting. Letters sent between mother and child traveled through layers of interception, often delayed or confiscated. The absence of familiar faces deepened Catherine's solitude. Only a handful of loyal women, her chamberlain, a few ladies-in-waiting and one Spanish confessor were allowed to remain. Each lived under constant scrutiny, their movements and correspondence monitored by royal agents stationed at the gate. Medical care was limited by deliberate design. Official records mention a single physician assigned to the castle, with no apothecary or surgeon in regular attendance. Tudor medicine relied heavily on herbal remedies and imported compounds, but the accounts show these were delivered irregularly, sometimes not at all. When Catherine's health faltered, her staff petitioned for additional help, but requests were often denied or ignored. The isolation extended beyond the physical. It was a calculated effort to restrict her access to information, support, and even the basic necessities of convalescence. Inside her private rooms, Catherine's world narrowed to a few trusted faces and the silent anxiety that came with every new decree from London. The routines of prayer and letter writing offered some comfort, but the strain of separation and the uncertainty of her fate weighed heavily. In such conditions, the seeds of rumour took root easily. Every cough, every missed meal, every whispered conversation was noted, reported, and sometimes distorted before it reached the outside world. The hardship of daily life at Kimbolton was more than inconvenience. It was a slow, grinding pressure that tested loyalty and hope alike. Rumours about Catherine's failing health did not stay locked behind the walls of Kimbolton. Each day, reports travelled out through a network that stretched far beyond the castle. Royal messengers carried dispatches to London, but it was the diplomatic packets, especially those sent by Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, that shaped the story across Europe. Chapuis received updates from Catherine's dwindling circle and relayed them to the Spanish court, sometimes within days. His coded letters bundled into the official diplomatic pouch crossed the channel on a regular schedule. By the time news reached Madrid or Brussels, every detail, her pallor, her appetite, the tone of her prayers had been filtered through layers of anxiety and suspicion. Pamphlets and scribes in London picked up whispers from returning couriers and dismissed servants. These writers, many supported by noble patrons or foreign envoys, produced short, hand-copied sheets that circulated through inns, churches and city streets. Some pamphlets described Catherine's symptoms in lurid detail, others hinted at dark forces at work in the royal household. The routes were informal but effective. A rumour seeded in a London tavern could reach Paris or Antwerp in a matter of weeks, carried by merchants, clerks or itinerant priests. Payments for such pamphlets often came from those with political interests, imperial agents, Catholic sympathisers or even rivals within Henry's own court. The absence of clear medical information only fed the speculation. With no official bulletin and no trusted physician's report, every scrap of news became amplified. Reports of Catherine's swelling belly or sudden weakness were repeated, embroidered and sometimes twisted to fit the fears of the listener. Ambassadors sent daily summaries back to their sovereigns, each one coloured by the shifting alliances and anxieties of the time. 
some dispatches openly questioned whether Catherine's decline was natural, while others accused the King's Council of orchestrating her demise by subtler means. By early 1536, the rumour machinery was in full motion. The lack of a formal autopsy left a void that pamphleteers and diplomats rushed to fill. Theories of slow poisoning, secret medicines and silent assassins flourished in this vacuum. In the absence of hard evidence, information became a weapon wielded by those who stood to gain or lose from Catherine's fate. The machinery of rumour once set in motion proved impossible to contain, shaping the narrative not just in England but across the royal courts of Europe. Subscribe for more groundbreaking historical investigations. In the heart of the cathedral archives, a slim volume sits behind glass. Its faded inscription and hand-stitched binding have drawn the attention of historians for centuries, but it is the meticulous paperwork accompanying the artifact that now commands equal scrutiny. Each item believed to have belonged to Catherine of Aragon is accompanied by a documented trail, accession certificates dating back to the late 18th century, conservation logs from every major restoration, and signed statements from each custodian who has overseen its care. The earliest records, penned in looping script, confirm the transfer of Catherine's prayer book from Kimbolton to the Cathedral Treasury in 1731. Subsequent entries detail every relocation, from temporary exhibition in the 1870s to secure storage during the Second World War. Environmental logs chart the conditions in which these artefacts have been kept. For the past several decades, temperature has been held steady at 18 degrees Celsius, with relative humidity maintained at 50%. Each annual audit, initialed by cathedral archivists and conservation staff, confirms that the items have not left the controlled environment except under escort for scholarly examination. Chain of custody forms record every instance of handling, including the dates and signatures of researchers, conservators and clergy. No unexplained gaps appear in the record. Even the transport cases are tagged with tamper evidence seals and barcodes, logged into a central database accessible only to authorised personnel. Before any scientific sampling, independent reviewers cross-check these records. The archivist's final sign-off, dated just before the laboratory team's arrival, certifies that the prayer book and associated textiles have remained undisturbed since their last documented inspection. This unbroken sequence of custody, combined with stable storage conditions, provides the foundation for any molecular analysis that follows. The integrity of the evidence depends not only on the age or origin of the item, but on the certainty that every step has been observed, recorded and preserved. In this way, the story of Catherine's artefacts is not just told through their physical presence, but through the paper trail that has guarded them for generations. Inside the laboratory, the process begins with the strict separation of ancient artefacts from all modern materials. Each item is handled under filtered airflow, with gloves and masks changed between every sample. The team uses non-destructive swabbing, collecting microscopic traces from the surface of Catherine of Aragon's prayer book and clothing fragments. No cutting, scraping or removal of visible material is permitted. Swabs are immediately sealed, barcoded and logged into a digital chain of custody system, matching the standards required for forensic evidence. Security is maintained at every step. Environmental DNA called eDNA is the first target. Analysts focus on short DNA fragments, typically 30 to 100 base pairs, as these are most likely to survive centuries of decay. Each DNA sequence is checked for characteristic damage patterns, specifically the rate of cytosine to thymine changes at the ends of strands. Only samples showing at least 2% terminal cytosine to thymine transitions are considered authentic and ancient enough to be credible. This threshold helps rule out modern contamination, which lacks such damage. Authenticity is assessed with conservative criteria. Protein analysis, known as paleoproteomics, runs in parallel. Using mass spectrometry, the team identifies peptide fragments recovered from the swabbed material. For a peptide to be accepted as genuine, it must match with at least 95% certainty to a known human or microbial protein. Analysts run every sample in duplicate, using separate instruments and separate operators. If a peptide or DNA sequence appears in only one run, it is automatically excluded. Only results confirmed in both runs are advanced for interpretation. Confidence comes from independent replication. Elemental analysis of the artefacts uses X-ray fluorescence. This method maps heavy metals, 
including lead, mercury, and arsenic on the surface, all without touching the artifact itself. Data from Catherine-linked items are compared to reference textiles from the same period, establishing a baseline for what would be considered normal environmental exposure. Any anomaly must be at least three standard deviations above this baseline to be flagged for further study. Maintaining a rigorous baseline prevents false positives. Throughout the process, negative controls, that is unused swabs and blank extraction solutions, are run alongside every batch. If any signal appears in a control, the entire batch is discarded and repeated. By the end of the workflow, only data passing every authentication gate are included in the final analysis. The result is a set of molecular findings that, while limited by age and preservation, can be trusted to reflect the true biological and chemical history of the artifacts. Trust in the methods underpins every conclusion. If you want more investigations like this, subscribe for more groundbreaking historical investigations. 27 distinct peptide families were identified across samples drawn from Catherine of Aragon's prayer book bindings and preserved garment seams. Each peptide signal passed the dual authentication gates, a minimum 95% match to known human or microbial proteins, and confirmation in duplicate runs by independent operators. The most abundant categories included fragments of collagen, keratin, and a set of immune response proteins, among them elevated levels of acute phase reactants commonly linked to chronic inflammation. Peptide run counts averaged 14 per sample, with a confidence interval exceeding 98% for all accepted identifications. No single use or ambiguous results were advanced. Elemental mapping revealed concentrations of heavy metals well above period baselines. Lead was detected at levels 40 times higher than the mean established from contemporary Tudor textiles. Mercury readings were 15-fold above control specimens, while arsenic concentrations reached eight times the background average. These findings were consistent across both textile and parchment samples linked to Catherine, with statistical anomalies confirmed at three standard deviations or greater above the reference set. Each outlier zone was mapped spatially to areas of direct skin contact, collar interiors, sleeve linings, and the edges of the prayer book most frequently handled. X-ray fluorescence scans produced clear visualizations of elemental distribution. Lead hotspots clustered along the neckline of garment fragments and the lower margins of the prayer book cover. Mercury was most concentrated in the underarm regions and at the corners of the manuscript binding, while arsenic appeared in scattered patches, often co-located with traces of copper and sulfur, hinting at mixtures consistent with known Tudor-era cosmetic and medicinal compounds. All readings were normalized against both artifact mass and surface area, with environmental controls run alongside each batch to exclude the possibility of modern contamination. Protein spectra included signatures of oxidative stress and tissue remodeling, as indicated by the presence of deamidated collagen and fragments of C-reactive protein. These markers, while not diagnostic of a single disease, point to sustained physiological strain in the months before death. Microbial DNA fragments recovered from textile seams suggested a predominance of skin flora, with no evidence of soil-derived contamination or modern laboratory interference. All negative controls remained clear throughout the analysis, and no batch was advanced without passing every authentication threshold. The dataset, while limited by the fragmentary nature of ancient biomolecules, provides a quantitative record of Catherine's biological environment. The combination of immune-related peptides and heavy metal enrichment offers a molecular snapshot that will now be examined for its medical and historical meaning. For more groundbreaking historical investigations, subscribe. Lead, mercury and arsenic were not rare intruders in the daily lives of Tudor nobility. The chemical signals recovered from Catherine's artefacts matched the very toxic substances that filled the recipe books and apothecary jars of her era. Lead white, or caruse, was a staple of courtly cosmetics. Its fine powder created the pale, unblemished look favoured by queens and courtiers alike. Surviving instructions from the early 1500s describe its preparation. Lead strips soaked in vinegar until a crust forms, then ground and mixed with oils or animal fats. Ratios varied, but some recipes called for as much as one part led to three parts oil. Applied daily, it built up on skin and textiles, seeping through collars and cuffs. Mercury, too, found its way into Catherine's world. Ointments containing mercury compounds were prescribed for skin ailments, lice, 
and even as a treatment for the French pox. Medical records from the Tudor court include purchases of mercury-based salves, sometimes mixed with lard or beeswax. Chronic exposure, even at low doses, could trigger tremors, muscle weakness and digestive distress. In the laboratory, mercury concentrations on Catherine's garment seams and prayer book bindings reach levels consistent with years of repeated contact rather than a single accidental spill. Arsenic appears in smaller quantities, but its presence is no less telling. Used as a pigment in yellow dyes and sometimes as a tonic in medicinal preparations, arsenic could accumulate in fabrics and skin over time. Records from apothecaries in London and Cambridge list arsenic among their stock, often alongside copper and sulphur, for treating skin eruptions. The detection of arsenic in Catherine linked textiles, especially in areas that would have touched her neck and wrists, suggests steady, low-level exposure rather than a single acute event. A toxicologist examining these findings would note the pattern. The highest concentrations are mapped to zones of direct skin contact, not to food or drink stains. This spatial distribution is a hallmark of chronic dermal absorption, consistent with the cosmetic and medicinal practices of the period. The levels observed far exceed what would be expected from environmental contamination or storage in polluted conditions. They fall squarely within the range documented in other Tudor-era artefacts, known to have been worn or handled by women of the court. A medical historian looking at the protein signatures, especially the immune response peptides and markers of oxidative stress, sees evidence of a body under long-term strain. Chronic inflammation, tissue remodeling, and oxidative damage are not unique to any one illness, but together they fit a profile of gradual decline. The symptoms described by Catherine's attendants, weakness, swelling, loss of appetite, could result from years of low-dose poisoning by the very substances meant to enhance beauty or restore health. Yet these same symptoms overlap with those of cancer, autoimmune disease, and chronic infection, all conditions that Tudor medicine could neither diagnose nor treat effectively. The convergence of heavy metal signatures and biological markers points to a spectrum of possible causes. Environmental toxicity from daily routines, untreated chronic illness, or a combination of both. There is no clear fingerprint of deliberate poisoning, no concentrated residue in a single spot, no telltale spike matching a fatal dose. Instead, the evidence suggests a slow, cumulative burden carried over months and years, woven into the fabric of Catherine's final days, as surely as the threads of her garments. Subscribe for more groundbreaking historical investigations. Even centuries later, scientific progress keeps rewriting royal history. As DNA and chemical analysis illuminate what Tudor physicians could not, every artifact becomes a new witness. Today, the search for truth is not about undoing rumor, but about confronting how power and medicine still intertwine. History's mysteries endure, because each answer only sharpens the next question. Subscribe for more investigations that challenge what we think we know.